Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, so my name is Kevin Roney. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And I'm going to talk to you today about some work um, I've done on um, copy link drug delivery, but really modeling of transport in four cities. Okay, so um, I'll try to convince you in the talk that the, the models that I use uh, are quite similar to models that, that you might use when you're looking at transport processes. Uh, the subsurface and soils and rocks. Uh, so. Okay, so I'm coming from Department of Mathematics and Statistics, the University of Limerick in Ireland. Uh, so I'm a applied mathematician. Um, so all my work is modeling really, but I'll show you some uh, experiment results from, from other people. Uh, I'm also affiliated with uh, the center, um, which is working. Uh, the Census is in Solid State Pharmaceutical Center, which is a big Pharmaceutical Research Center in Ireland. Uh, so that's where the connection to um, research and drug, drug delivery comes in. Okay, so structure of the talk. I'm going to give you some background on myself, just to introduce myself. Uh, then I'll talk about chemical release from forest materials in the context of pharmaceuticals. Uh, after that, I look at uh, chemical release from forest materials in the context of coffee. And then the rest of the talk, I'll focus on some work uh, which was, came from my PhD on um, modeling extraction from fixed coffee beds out of models. Okay, so I guess a lot of you won't remember the University of Limerick. Uh, so the University of Limerick uh, is in Ireland. It's on the west coast of Ireland. Uh, so it's just uh, at the outlet of the River Shannon. So River Shannon is the, the biggest river in Ireland. And there's a picture here of the campus and you can see the, the River Shannon flows uh, right through the middle of the campus. Uh, so the campus is quite nice. It's about four or five kilometers outside Limerick City, which is a small city. I guess about 90,000 people. Uh, you can see that in the background. Okay, so if you're ever uh, in, in Ireland or in Limerick specifically, uh, even the campus is nice to visit and walk around the river. Okay, so the, the size of the university, um, it's, it's just 50 years old, so it's quite young. Um, we've got about nearly 18,000 students, 2,000 staff. Uh, traditional strength of university is in the science and engineering. Okay, so it was set up mainly to train engineers uh, for industry initially, and then it developed all, all the other courses. So the big center currently uh, driving research is the Bernal Institute, and they focus on biomaterials, uh, composites, uh, nanomaterials, a big, a big topic, uh, and also a, a big group of processes. Okay, so if you're interested in the Bernal Institute, um, you can check their website. And then there's UL also hosts quite a large, or quite a number of large research centers, which are centrally funded by the government. Uh, so SSPC, I mentioned, pharmaceutical research, but also uh, centers in smart manufacturing, data analytics, and computer science. So that just gives you an idea of uh, what UL is. The group I'm in is, is the Maxi Research Group. So Mathematics Applications Consortium for Science and Industry, it's quite a mouthful. Um, we, I think we're, we're Ireland's leading industrial and applied mathematics group. We were set up um, from a big grant from the state in 2006. And the centre is modelled on uh, the Oxford Centre for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. Okay, so that's a big centre in Oxford, which again tries to apply mathematics to uh, industry problems. Um, so we have quite a broad range of expertise. I fit in under the first bullet point here, which is expertise in differential equations, uh, fluid mechanics, but also with people doing stochastic modeling, so forecasts and other uncertainty. Um, complex networks is a, is a big area, so looking at network resilience, um, risk in networks, spread of information, spread of disease, uh, so this kind of stuff, but using network structure. And then we have a growing group in statistics, particularly in high dimensional data analysis, so analyzing. Um, big data, if you like, but data which comes off manufacturing lines at high volume at a high rate, uh, which has a lot of missing data and there's, there's problems interpreting that data. We have, um, we're, we're funded to the <laughs> industry, so for that reason, we do a lot of short term collaboration as well as our own research. Um, we've worked with uh, different industries like Medicaid Pharma, through SSPC, uh, Food and Drink. Uh, so the coffee research, for example, but also uh, other topics, materials manufacturing, uh, finance and energy. So we work with the, the state uh, gas network uh, and so on. Okay, so quite a broad range of stuff. 
Um, for that reason, we get the opportunity to work on a lot of different uh, topics. Uh, the SSPC then is, is a much bigger uh, center. It's headquartered in Emmerich, but actually it's got researchers in all of the, the big uh, institutions in Ireland, so nine different uh, higher education institutes. And it covers the full range of pharmaceutical R and D. Okay, so it goes all the way from research in, in molecules, uh, to materials, uh, developing medicines, uh, manufacturing lines, and then the team that I'm associated with is the, the modeling team. Okay, and then the modeling team interacts with the other teams uh, depending on what they're interested in. Uh, so the modeling team is quite big, just a small part of it. Uh, they do things like quantum mechanical modeling, molecular modeling investigate how different chemicals interact, uh, statistics, and then the part I'm involved with is modeling physicochemical processes. Uh, so this is like more mass media uh, dissolution. Okay, so again, if you're interested, you can look at that. Okay, so a little bit of detail myself before uh, I start uh, telling you about the research. Uh, so I did my PhD in 2013 to 2016 um, in Maxi and UL. Uh, this is where I did most of the work that I'll talk about today. So uh, modeling of coffee extraction. Uh, so basically transport process and force media. And the rest of my PhD, I did a year long funded project with industry, which was modeling cleaning of contact lenses. So it sounds quite different, but actually the model is again, it's just released from force matrix, which is a contact lens. And in this case, they're trying to remove a certain process aid from the system. Um, I then did a postdoc and quite well in SSPC, so in the research farm research center, but the topic is quite different. So it was, it was more on uh, assisting experimentalists with statistics or data analysis uh, and some work which was more physics based on flow and action progress. Um, so for two years I did something different, and then in 2020 I came back to working on uh, transport to force media, but this time in the context of modeling drug release. Uh, drug release um, in in vitro experiments. So experiments in the lab where researchers are trying to develop drug products, be robust, and to release uh, the drug over a certain period in a certain manner. Okay, so I did that for a year, I guess pretty much uh, during COVID. I started that research uh, in Rutgers University in the US. Uh, so it's the signpost here, it's a bit random. And when I arrived there, I found out it was twinned with Limerick. So in the center of uh, Rutgers, or the center of New Brunswick, there's a site for Limerick, uh, which was an interesting place. Uh, and then started in 2021, I'm in my current position, I'm lecturing in industrial biomathematics. Um, so I'm lecturing in the math department, but also continuing research on um, drug release. Okay, so that's enough background. Now a little bit about pharmaceuticals. Uh, before I move on to uh, Okay, so uh, what we're thinking about here uh, is drug delivery devices, but specifically devices with a pore structure. Okay, so these type of devices can be something like uh, a stent, so a stent that's inserted um, in your blood vessel, uh, but if you just put in a metal stent, um, you can have infection and so on. So these stints are often coated with some kind of polymer, which is porous. The polymer is loaded with drug. And then it's important to understand how the drug releases uh, from the matrix system. Uh, similarly, you can have transdermal patches. Again, you release uh, through the skin. Uh, in this case, the skin is actually the pore system you want to model uh, the flow of drug through the, the skin. And then actually contact lenses in a different context to what I looked at them, but Contact lenses can also be loaded with drug um, uh, if you want to treat your eye. Okay, so again, release of drug for system. Um, I put in some pictures here from different papers. The first picture or the second picture here from McGinty 2015. Um, it's, a, it's an image of a stent actually, and you can see the pore structure of the stent, uh, which is what contains the, the, the dispersed drug. Uh, so in this case, actually, the pore structure is quite fine. The scale is two millimeters. So this structure is actually not on pores. Um, the second example is one we've worked with recently. Uh, so this is from paper 2013. Uh, and this is a micro CT image of uh, a granule. The dimension here is about, I think it's a one millimeter roughly across. And uh, it might be hard to see, but the, essentially the black sections in the granule 
uh, or where there were drug crystals, but those drug crystals have now been dissolved. Uh, dissolved drug is diffused out of the granule and is effectively released. Uh, so we can have a therapeutic action. Okay, so the idea is drug release is controlled by the pore structure. Uh, so if we want to understand drug release, we need to understand diffusion through the structure, uh, possibly evolution of the structure as drug dissolves, the porosity is changing. So we expect extraction to speed up and then there are also various other processes like um, swelling, uh, wettability, how fast can dissolve and get in. Um, Biodegradation is becoming more important. People um, want to have, let's say, the stint coating. They want the stint coating to biodegrade. It's, they want to leave in the body. So over time, the, the stint is also degrading. So the structure adds eroding. So all these processes are important. So, so the idea for our current project is, is just to improve the modeling and understanding uh, of release from these type of forest systems. Okay, so what are, what are the targets then? What, what, what do we want our models to predict? And really, it's just we want to predict the, the release profile and understand what the mechanisms, uh, important mechanisms are. So on the top right of the screen, um, this is for, for a tablet. So here we're looking at oral solid dosage forms. So anything you take orally, so tablets, uh, capsules, or capsules contain granules, uh, so anything like this. And uh, the process looks something like this. So we have um, possibly coated tablet. First, the coat has to dissolve. That takes a certain amount of time. Uh, then we have a, a tablet with a structure. And depending on the release mechanism, if we want it to release fast, the tablet probably disintegrates quite quickly. And materials are chosen so that it does disintegrate. And then we have a population of granules, but the granules are still porous. So we want to model release from those porous granules. Um, or if you want a really fast release, the granules also deaggregate, they break up, and then you have individual drug particles, and you just want to model the release from um, solid drug particles. Uh, so the last part is, is probably the easiest. So if we have a rapid release um, tablet, it's designed to disintegrate fast. So if we assume it disintegrates fast, you just have to model um, the solution of a population of solid particles. So no force needed. But the more interesting case for us is sustained release products. This is where you want to use the pore structure uh, to control the release. Um, and in particular, uh, if you look at the graph here, this is a graph of drug concentration uh, in the blood. Um, and for a drug to be active, it has to have some minimum effective concentration. But the concentration can't be too high or it gets toxic. Okay, so. So sometimes people will get, will take multiple fast releasing products and you might get something like the, the red uh, on off drug release. But with sustained release uh, tablets or uh, other kind of systems, you want to produce something that looks like this. So you want to sustain the release over the course um, of the, the dosage rate. Okay, so again, can you design a, a tablet to achieve a consistent release like this? Okay, so again, the idea is the, the transport in the force medium of the single drug or uh, multi-drug formulations, multiple drugs, uh, is important to be able to achieve uh, these goals. Okay, so just to give you an idea of the link scale, so the scales are obviously a lot smaller than what you see in geological structures, um, but actually, I guess you, you do actually go down and model some of these things. Um, these scales. So uh, we have poor structures of carry, carrier material, so it's some kind of sugar or something that just carries the drug. Uh, and then we have dispersed drugs. Uh, in terms of the scales, the poor scales, I uh, showed you a picture with nanometer scale, but more typically, I guess, the pores on the scale of microns, uh, tablets in particular. The drug particles, when they're manufactured, it can be nanoparticles, but more typically, they're on the micron scale, so one to 100 microns. Uh, granules, granules essentially are a combination of drug uh, and again some carrier material, and they can be maybe 100 uh, microns up to millimeter. And then tablets, so you can be taking tablets, you know the size they are, they can be millimeters up to centimeters. 
Okay, so again, there's a range of scales here. Uh, we don't want to have to model the complete structure of, of a granule like this. We want some kind of uh, models which are defined on the scale of the granular tablet. Uh, in terms of what we're modeling, we want to model uh, some of these um, defined apparatus for uh, measuring drug release. So on the top right here, we have a, a, actually a flow truce apparatus. So this is um, one of four um, approved apparatus for drug testing. Uh, here there's a tablet uh, sitting in the apparatus. The flow is coming from the bottom up. And in this case, it's releasing, releasing a tracer. So we can see uh, roughly how the drug is releasing it. Okay, so these systems will be run by 37 degrees to replicate body temperature, um, but also a specific pH to replicate the stomach and the intestines, uh, and also a specific viscosity. Uh, the hydrodynamics are controlled, fixed flow rate, um, or a defined flow rate at least, and the apparatus is regulated. Okay, so we want to be able to model, uh, have different tablet formulations, depending on materials, porosity, and so on, uh, will behave in in these type of tests. Um, okay, so again, the idea is there's an opportunity to adapt models, which is actually what we've been doing, um, that are used like in groundwater flow, transport, um, to these type of courses. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to coffee, so I'm just gonna mention if you're interested, we've done some initial work on simple granular systems. So this is, um, we assume the granules are approximately spherical. Uh, they have defined porosity. Uh, they have defined drug loading. Um, in this case, the granules are solubility limited, which is something that's not usually looked at in the literature. So essentially, when the drug dissolves internally in the granule, um, it soon reaches the solubility. And so extraction is limited by the drug solubility. So this happens in, in low solubility drug. And in this case, if we do the analysis, um, we can see that essentially the drug saturates everywhere uh, in the granule and extraction happens. Uh, so you get a moving boundary model. Okay, so you get a, a region in the center which is saturated with drug or, and a shell region uh, where the drug has, has dissolved but is diffusing uh, within the granule. Okay, so again, we can predict uh, release from these type of granules uh, given the uh, physiochemical information. Okay, so we've done some additional work on that. But again, we haven't accounted for stuff like the external hydrodynamics, we've made some simplifying assumptions. And if the system is porous enough, there can also be flow through the granule. So we've assumed that these granules are uh, spherically symmetric, but if there's a flow through the granule, that's no longer the case, and we need more complicated ones. Okay, so this, this is the kind of stuff that, that I'm working on at the moment. Um, but what I want to talk to you about for the rest of the talk um, is how these type of models work and if we want to model the extraction of a coffee. Okay, is there any questions so far? No, but then so whatever you mentioned is purely diffusion. Diffusion, yeah. No, no addiction. No addiction. Um, at the surface, there's a there's a condition which decides the balance of uh, addiction and diffusion. Uh, but it's a, it's a simple thing assumption. Boundary there, I guess. Some it's an analytical model that you have, or it's... Um, we have an analytical solution, and then we also have to solve the even our full problem. Even though it's simplified, it has to be solved in great detail. So, well, why are we modeling copy? It seems like a strange thing to. To start suddenly getting interested in. And this comes from the fact that, again, we're an industrial mathematics group, uh, and every year we hold these workshops with industry. So we invite industry for one week to give us a set of problems. Uh, we work on the problem for a week, we produce a report, and then afterwards, maybe uh, in my case, a PhD comes out of the problem, or sometimes if the problem is simple enough, there's a solution given to industry uh, pretty quickly. Um, so in this case, Philips Research, so Philips from uh, the Netherlands, they were interested in modeling of coffee extraction, uh, basically to help the design of their machines. They done a lot of experiments, but they didn't really have modeling capabilities. So there was an initial report written. Um, at these events, we invite a lot of people from 
but the UK, but also Europe, uh, with backgrounds in applied mathematics, mechanical engineering, uh, chemistry, and so on. Uh, so this is a, you get the, I guess, the benefit of a team of people. Uh, so there's even someone from the Department of Earth Sciences in Oxford. So right here you can see this, there's some crossover. Um, so you get a lot of information, a lot of ideas and reports in the week, and then afterwards, um, PhD or postdoc or someone works on these problems if, if the industry is still interested. Okay, so during that week, they did some approximate experiments and tried some models and got some ideas of what might be interesting. Uh, so after that, the following year, I started my PhD, and for the first half of my PhD, uh, I worked on trying to come up with models of coffee extraction. Um, so just to remind everyone what exactly coffee is, so coffee is grown on coffee trees, uh, two main types, Arabica and Robusta. Uh, once the cherries are grown, they're harvested, they're washed, they're dried, um, they're then roasted, so usually an industrial roaster, but you could also roast them on uh, your stovetop, uh, like the picture here. And the roasting develops the flavors, there's different chemical reactions, it goes from green to the characteristic brown color, and you're producing a lot of the aromatic uh, flavor compounds that like, we would taste eventually in the cup. Um, so once you have the beans, then you can't extract coffee from coffee beans unless you want to wait a long time. So you grind down the beans uh, to a certain size to facilitate extraction, uh, and then you essentially you grind depending on the extraction method. Okay, so if you want to extract fast, you grind beans really fine, so like espresso, or if you can wait a while, like a French press, you grind it a bit finer. So grinding is just to facilitate extraction, and then the last part that we're interested in um, is the extraction of all the chemicals that we want to taste and the coffee uh, using some kind of extraction method, uh, which is almost always with uh, water. So you have hot, hot brew or cold brew, um, which the, the solvent is always water. Okay, so this is the part of the process that we're interested in. Um, all these steps are important. You need good quality coffee, you need to roast it properly, you need to grind it, grind it appropriate for your method, uh, but there's still a lot of things you can do right or wrong uh, in the last step, uh, which is what Phillips were, were particularly interested in. Okay, so again, uh, the team is, is porous materials, uh, so coffee is a porous material. So this time, unlike in pharma, we have a natural porous structure, uh, so it's just the cellular structure of the coffee. Um, so this is an SEM image. I don't think you can see the, the scale, but this scale is 100 microns. Uh, so what you're seeing here is the, the cells of the coffee bean. Um, so this is an image of a roasted bean. Uh, you can see the, the cells have been evacuated, so the moisture has, has left during the roasting. Uh, and all the soluble material is contained in the cell walls. So that's what we need to extract. Um, it's very complex uh, chemically. There's about 2,000 different chemicals so far have been identified in the body. Uh, so it's quite a, quite a complicated system. Uh, the link scales, uh, coffee beans, again, uh, you've seen coffee beans, about a centimeter maybe. Ground coffee depends on the, the application. So for espresso, the mean volumetric diameter is about two to 300 microns. Uh, so small enough. Uh, drip filter, uh, it's a bit bigger, so four to five hundred because drip filter coffee you 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 a bit longer to extract some material, and then fridge press can be up to hundred meters. Uh, the pore scale, which is important because we're going to be looking at multi-scale modeling, um, is quite a bit smaller, at least uh, than the average diameter. Uh, so these cells are like maybe twenty to fifty microns uh, in diameter, and then the the macro scale for us is the, is the coffee bed. Uh, the coffee bed for espresso is about six centimeters in diameter, and the depth, well, maybe a little less than two centimeters. And then, so you pack the, the grains into the bed. So there's pores within the grains, which look like this. But there's also space between the grains. Uh, and the size, again, is something on the micron scale. So I can't put a number on that one, but again, the scales are, are something similar to uh, the cell scale. Okay, so the motivation for modeling. Uh, well, Phillips were interested, they a lot of experimental data, 
Um, it looks like an interesting problem. And the big problem with copy extraction is it's highly variable. So essentially the extraction depends on, on everything. It depends on the raw material, it depends on the chemistry of the water, it depends on the humidity in the room. Um, so that's a problem because for us to set up their optimal extraction on day one and on day two, they do the same settings, but it tastes different. Maybe because the temperature changed or, or even they've told me that if they're grinding coffee over a day, the grinder gets hotter. So the size distribution changes and the coffee tastes different. Um, so these kind of things are important. Uh, for Philips, well, they want to manufacture machines which are uh, as robust and repeatable as possible. So if you set up what you think is, is the best flavor, which would be different for different people, you want that to be repeatable, uh, so they want their systems to be robust. Uh, the other uh, thing is a more recent uh, result. So essentially the problem with coffee is you don't want to extract everything, because if you over-extract, it tastes bitter. And that means you have to stop at some point and, and maybe you're wasting a, a lot of flavor that you could be getting. Um, so more recent results suggest if you can extract uniformly in the coffee bed, you can take, have a higher yield and use less coffee. So maybe you could use 20% less coffee for every espresso sh shot, and that would then save a lot, a lot of money in wastage. Okay, so that's a relatively uh, new idea um, from, from results from some colleagues recently. Okay, so before we come up with the model, we want to know what we want to predict. Um, sorry to say I want to predict the flavor of coffee, because what does that mean? Um, so the idea is essentially we want to take all the input parameters, uh, so the raw materials, grain size distribution, um, coffee origin and roasting level, so that's just the size of diffusion, coefficients and solubilities there, water chemistry, uh, design of the uh, machine, whatever machine it is, and then what we want to predict is the extraction yield and the brew strength, so just two quantities. Okay, that seems oversimplified. But again, the reason it is, is because there's no better measures. So essentially when people evaluate coffee taste, you get a, a team of tasters, they look at one of these complicated flavor wheels and they pick out a flavor and they say, well, maybe it's an ashy flavor or something like that. And then they write it in the report. So our model, uh, our model can't predict this. Uh, and it's not well known what chemicals uh, correlate to what flavors. So if we knew if we could map chemicals to flavors, maybe we could predict chemical release and then that would be okay. But actually that's not possible. So instead we use a simpler quality measure, which is used in industry, and that's the copy brew control chart. Uh, so this chart has two measures. One is just total dissolved solids. So how much dissolved material is there in your coffee cup? That's just how much coffee is dissolved divided by the mass of your drink. And then extraction yield. Uh, so the extraction yield is how much of the dry coffee do you extract? So dissolved coffee mass uh, divided by dry coffee mass. Uh, so extraction yield really is the important measure. And you can relate extraction yields to total dissolved solids quite easily. Uh, so when baristas are, at least at the top level, are trying to come up with the right settings, they calculate the extraction yield uh, by taking a refractometer and measuring uh, the total dissolved solids in their, in their drink. Uh, so fortunately extraction yield correlates quite well with flavour, so controlling extraction yield is essentially controlling the flavour. Okay, so let me briefly explain what, what these charts mean. So on the x-axis we have the extraction yield, uh, on the y or the vertical axis we have the strength, and for drip filter coffee it's quite weak, so the strength target is 1.2 to 1.5% depends on your preference. But what's more robust is the extraction yield. So if, if you extract less than about 80% of the mass of coffee, there's no complex flavors at your drink. Essentially, you just extract the, the lower molecular mass compounds and you're missing out on a lot of nicer flavors. If you keep extracting, you get some of the more interesting flavors, um, sweeter flavors, chocolate flavors, and so on. But if you extract too far, and according to taste tests, too far is about 
the coffee just starts tasting bitter, you extract higher molecular mass compounds, and that flavor masks everything else. So it just, just doesn't taste good. Uh, so that's for drip filter. For espresso, what's interesting is the extraction yield target is actually essentially the same. So this chart is 18 to 21%. So apparently that's ideal in favor. The strength is a lot different. Okay, so if you drink espresso, you know it's strong, it's viscous. And depending on the type of espresso, uh, if it's uh, lungo, it's, it's a bit weaker. If it's ristretto, uh, it's much stronger. So strength is a matter of preference, but extraction yield uh, apparently um, is important to control flavor. Okay, so, so in, in barista speak, this is called brewing in the box. So when they make it a shot, they map it on one of these charts and they decide, as well as tasting, of course, uh, whether it's good or not. Okay, so that's giving us some targets at least. So we want to take all the raw material properties, the equipment settings, and we want to predict the extraction yield and the brew strength, and be able to give someone a model and say, well, if you change the settings, this is how it affects extraction yield or brew strength. Okay, so I said it's a very complicated system, maybe surprisingly complicated. Uh, so we need to make some assumptions uh, because well, we're math mathematicians, so we, we need something simple enough to try and solve, maybe get, get a solution we can write down or at least numerically. Uh, so this is the experimental setup for Philips. Again, it, it just looks like uh, uh, it's a porta filter for espresso, it's loaded with coffee. Uh, they clamp it shut. Uh, they take a little a bigger sample than espresso and the temp and the pressures are lower, but essentially it's the same thing. Okay, so the coffee goes, the water goes in the top, the coffee comes out the bottom, uh, and they measure the concentration or the total of solids over the course of extraction. And they also measure the particle size distribution, uh, porosity, and all these other things that we need um, for models. So we make some assumptions. We assume the water temperature is fixed. I would put model temperature change, but it seemed like a good thing to choose fixed at the start, especially as these experiments are controlled strictly at, at 90 degrees. Um, we don't model the initial wetting phase. We don't model the drainage phase. So we don't model on saturated flow. Uh, so we, well, we've done a little bit of it since, but we haven't done it properly yet. Uh, so we only model uh, the steady stage where the coffee bed is saturated with water and we have a um, a flow through the bed. And then what are we modeling? Well, like I said, we can't, well, we, we could try and model all the different chemical species, but we don't have enough information to do that. So we model one chemical entity, which is called coffee. Uh, so we're just modeling a concentration of coffee and we're assigning to coffee some solubility and some diffusivity, which are only effective parameters because they represent a whole set of different chemicals, uh, which extract at different rates. But this assumption is okay if we can produce something which uh, maps to the game. Okay, so coming to uh, the modeling. Uh, so it's a multi scale system. Uh, we've got porosity at different scales, but this is how I try to represent it. Um, so on the left hand side is kind of a map of the different flows in the system. So we have some water reservoir, the water is pumped in to the bed. And the water goes, it goes into intergranular pores. So this is the pores uh, between the grains, which is in blue over here. And then at the bottom, we get out liquid, but the liquid is now loaded to the top. Okay, so inside the bed, what's happening then is, is all of, of these processes. Uh, so the water soaks into the grains. Um, inside in the grains, we have a structure, the cell structure I talked about. We've got pores, we've got solid coffee, uh, so we have coffee dissolving into the pore system, and then we have diffusion of coffee uh, out of the grains, back into the intergranular pores, and then advection washes it. Uh, the other thing we have to account for uh, is when we when we break the beans, uh, we get a lot of fine particles, and the surfaces, the cells in the surface are all broken. Okay, so we also have direct dissolution from the surface of the grains directly into the intergranular pores. And that process is fast. Okay, so we have a fast process uh, of extraction, and we have a slow process of extraction, which is controlled by diffusion uh, through the matrix. 
Okay, so I think I've covered all the points. Uh, the system exhibits, exhibits porosity at two scales, so we actually get a, a double porosity model. So when we do our averaging, so when we take the microstructure, uh, we write down the microscale equations, uh, we integrate those over the volumes. Um, we first integrate um, this system uh, to produce uh, equations in the grain level, and then we then integrate the whole system to produce equations in the macro scale. Okay, so the, the idea of volume averaging, I'm sure a lot of you maybe are familiar with it, uh, is we take a complicated micro scale system, uh, we average it, and all of the interfacial transfers of the micro scale appear as, as sources on uh, the macro scale equations. Okay, so again, some key points. We're kind of looking at espresso beds, or maybe drip filter systems like Phillips had with a shower head where the grains don't really move. Okay, that makes things a lot easier for us because if the grains are moving, the bed is moving, and then we have to model um, flow of solid as well as the flow of liquid. So we're assuming the bed is static, pores are saturated with water. Um, the flow to the intergranular pores, if we do the volume averaging, make some assumptions, we're just using Darcy's law with probability got from the Cassini Cameron equation. Um, we assume that inside the grains, you, you saw this complicated cell structure, essentially we assume there's no flow in there. Um, so there's no flow in the grains, there's just flow between the grains, uh, the solids are static, and then we write down, or we get equations about an averaging for conservation of coffee uh, in the intergranular pores between the grains, uh, in intragranular pores, so in the liquid phase, but inside the grains, and then for solid coffee. Uh, like I said, the influence of microstructure is captured in effective properties on the macro scale. So probabilities, fusivities, the solution rates, and they have to depend on the porosity, specific surface area, and so on. Okay, so we have to either get these relationships from averaging or from some constitutive uh, laws. Uh, okay, so that's the last point. Okay, so before I show you the equations, uh, a quick comment on how we model the release. Okay, so if we look at the grain size distribution, again, which Philips have measured all this data for us for coffee, um, there's two peaks, or, or some people argue there might be a third peak, but there's definitely two main peaks. There is the characteristic size, which is what I mentioned earlier. Uh, so this for the coarse grind here is maybe up to a millimeter, so that might be for a French press grind. Uh, or the fine grind here is maybe it's 400 microns. Okay, so these are the characteristic size that we target. But when we fracture uh, the beans, uh, we get all these fine particles which are broken cells. So that's the second peak here. Um, and the second peak is particles that are like 20 microns in diameter. Okay, so these are fast extracting particles. And they also regulate the flow because they've got a high surface area. So in terms of volume, they're not important, but if we plotted the number of particles, we would have much more fine particles. Uh, and then possibly there's a third peak of sub-micron size particles, but it's hard to identify here. But that might be important if you wanted to decide if the system gets clogged or not. Okay, so for modeling then, we divide our grain size distribution into uh, two parts a fast releasing part, which we calculate from the volume of the fine uh, particles and some estimate of how much um, surface counts for uh, larger particles. Okay, so I call this surface coffee because it's accessible to the, the flow. And then we also have uh, coffee, which is contained in the kernel um, of the grain. So it's just slow releasing coffee. Okay, so if we zoom in on the particular grain, uh, we have the structure. Uh, we have uh, phi h, which is the porosity of the intergranular pores, or volume fraction. And within the grain, we have a, a void volume fraction, but we also have a, a fraction of uh, coffee, which is, is at the surface. So this is important. If, if we just average all the information at the microscale out, we couldn't reproduce what happened. Okay, so we have to capture two different scales uh, of extraction. Okay, so. Flow equations are pretty standard, I think. Uh, we have Darcy's law with permeability depending on the porosity 
of the intergranular pores. Um, we also have the compressibility, which we assume, and maybe it's not completely true. And then if we assume the, the porosity between the grains and the viscosity is constant, uh, we can reduce to uh, the Laplace equation. Okay, so I'm going to go through these equations reasonably quickly, but I'm just going to tell you what each of the terms are. So the first equation, we're tracking the change in the concentration of coffee and the pores between the grains. You can see here we have the porosity. This first part is advection of coffee uh, out of the system. Uh, we have a complicated term from Kazini Carmen. Uh, we have diffusion transport, we have dispersion transport. So dispersion just comes from, I guess, loss of information when we average the microscale flow. And then we have two sources. So when we average, we get a source um, into the intergranular pores from the grain kernels. And this is driven by difference in concentration, the link scale, the fusion coefficient, and so on. And we get another source term, and this is the fast extraction term. And that comes from the really small particles uh, and the surface. And again, that's driven by a difference in concentration, so concentration rate, effectively. And it's proportional to the fraction of coffee remaining, uh, which is something you have to get to track. Okay, so that's mass balance in the intergranular pores. Inside the coffee, in the liquid phase, we also have a balance. So we have rate of change of this time porosity isn't constant, so we have to keep it in here. We have concentration of coffee. Um, and then we have our transfer terms. So we're losing coffee to the intergranular pores. So this term here uh, is matching this term here. And then we have dissolution in turn. Okay, so we're we're gaining uh, coffee in the voids because coffee is dissolved in the cell walls. Okay, again, there's a lot of different parameters I don't really want to mention. You can probably guess dV is diffusion coefficient. Um, M here is a link scale to the size of the cell. Uh, so. Okay, there, this, is, this is just how we track um, how much coffee is remaining in the system. So we have, like I said, two populations of coffee. Here, the equation of scales to track the fraction of coffee remaining. So it's the fraction of coffee remaining uh, in the fines and on the surface. Uh, again, it's proportional at concentration gradients, link scales, and so on. And we have an equivalent equation for the amount of coffee in the grain kernels. And then as we dissolve coffee, we change the porosity of the grains. So we have an extra equation, which is just updating uh, the porosity by V, so the bite volume fraction indicates. And again, there's, there's some different parameters here which really just come from scaling as well. So we focus on this. Okay, so I think I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna just put some notes on model reduction and then show you some experimental results and then uh, finish up. Okay, so the equations, um, Maybe they're not super complicated compared to systems people saw uh, in open form, but they're still relatively complicated, so we want to understand what all the different parameters do. So we non-dimensionalize the equations, we compare the size of different terms. Um, we noted for percolation, so for drip filter or espresso, advection dominates strongly over uh, diffusion or dispersion in the intergranular pores. So in our model, we just neglect diffusion and dispersion. Um, sometimes we leave some diffusion in, but mainly for numerical issues. Uh, if we're looking at a cylindrical coffee bed like espresso, it seems reasonable that we take a one-dimensional model to just transport in one dimension. Um, and then almost all the parameters, if you have the experimental abilities that Phillips do, you can get from experimental measurement, but there's some that you can't. So the integrality of porosity, you can measure it in the dry beds, but as soon as you apply the pressure, uh, the bed compacts a little bit. So we, we have to get that porosity um, by matching it to the flow. So Phillips measured the pressure, they measured the flow rate. Uh, so if we fit our um, Darcy's law using porosity, uh, we can estimate what the porosity is. Um, the effective diffusion coefficients, of course, you can't look these up because they're for coffee. Uh, so again, uh, we have to leave these uh, as fitting parameters uh, compared to experiment. 
Okay, so then I'm just going to show you one comparison uh, of the model uh, to an experiment. And it's good. Okay, so we're back to the cylindrical uh, system. Uh, Phillips has done other geometries, but this is the easiest one uh, to look at. Um, here we have diameter, which, or sorry, radius, which is about well, three centimeters, so the diameter six. And they've taken a deeper bed than would be common for espresso. So there's 60 grams of coffee here. If you're looking at a double espresso, that's only about 18 grams. So the bed is a bit longer than espresso. Uh, the grind is finer, so the pressure is bigger. So they fix the flow rate. Uh, they measure the pressure drop. So it's 2.3 bar, so about the third of the pressure of an espresso extraction. And we look at their results and we compare our 1D um, model with a uh, 2D axis symmetric. Okay, so this, this is the 2D simulation of fluent. I'm just plotting the velocity streamlines. So there's liquid pumped in at the top. Um, there's a little headspace here. It hits the bed, so the bed starts here. And it's very boring, really. You can see, essentially, it looks one-dimensional, which we kind of expect. Um, the velocity is constant, and the pressure drop uh, agrees exactly with what we have in the one-dimensional simulation. Um, so it seems like for a system, maybe one of these is enough. Uh, in terms of the concentration measured uh, by Phillips, so the initial liquid coming out is the most concentrated. Uh, so it's very concentrated, 250 kilograms per meters cubed. Uh, so this um, we attribute to extraction from all these fine grains, which happen very quickly. Uh, and then very quickly the extraction drops off, and then the slower, longer extraction comes from the grain kernels. Um, so there's not much difference between the 1D and 2D model, but we expect that because the flow is the same. Um, we need the two different link scales to capture this behavior. Uh, the other thing to note is we haven't done the initial part properly. Okay, so we've set the initial concentration and the integrative force to zero. When in fact, we should solve the unsaturated flow problem to get the initial conditions for our system. So this initial condition is incorrect. So where we have a concentration shooting up and hitting the first data point, really it should start somewhere up here and come down. Okay, so the nice thing about having a simulation is we can actually put it onto this coffee brewing control chart. And instead of looking at an extraction yields, we can look at something like a, an average extraction yields or how much the extraction yield changes in the bed. So here again, I mentioned this concentration part is incorrect. So this, we're following time here, but the extraction yield is increasing. And at some point it reaches the good region. So here, I guess after about 16 seconds, the extraction yield is hit the point where we should stop this extraction and say, oh, this flavor is good. Now the Phillips experiments were run to complete extraction, so they finish at about 32% uh, percent extraction, which is 30% is roughly the maximum you can extract in coffee at 90 degrees. So what's useful here? Well, we can track um, the extraction yield over time, but we can also put like standard deviation on the extraction. So extracted in the uniform, we extract more at the top and the bottom. Uh, and from the models, we can give some idea how different the extraction is at the top and the bottom over the time of extraction. Um, so this is maybe a bit complicated to get your head around, but if you want to ask the questions after. Um, this is the same thing, it's just plotted at the end. And here I'm doing a, a fine grind, but also a coarse grind. So again, Phillips did experiments with a range of different grind sizes. So the fine grind, what we can see is actually we never get to the good region. The, the coffee is ground too fine. We, get, we, only, we can only get a restret up. We would have to grind the coffee coarser if we wanted to get into the good region. And the coarse case, uh, it's so slow at extracting. Um, we never even uh, get into the lumber region. So we would have to grind finer. So somewhere in between these two coffee grinds would be optimal. Um, we've played around with different geometries. So you can um, espresso port filters aren't always completely 
as cylindrical, whether or not as extreme as this. But if we look at different geometries, we can now see the flow is no longer one dimensional, and we can map how much has been extracted from different parts of the bed. So this is um, concentration of coffee in the bed initially. So initially it's uniform everywhere. And this is how much is remaining in the grains. So as time proceeds, uh, we extract first at the top and not so much at the bottom. So you can see the non-uniformity of extraction uh, across the bed. So again, this is just um, an axisymmetric simulation. I'm just showing half of uh, a conical coffee bed and it's been turned sideways. So I don't know if that's, if that's kind of obvious, but um, okay, so once we have the tools built, we can we can play with these uh, different things. Okay, so uh, to conclude then, um, dynamics of fluid flow has a big influence on extraction uniformity. Um, our models are very simple, it's just Darcy's law, but there's a lot more complicated uh, things happening uh, in the bed, like grain movement, uh, fines migration, change in porosity. Uh, so this is quite complicated, but even with simple models, we can give some idea of, of where it's been extracted more or less. Um, Extraction mapping is useful if you want to evaluate different uh, process settings or, or geometries. Uh, there's a recent paper uh, from Cameron et al. And they've taken, essentially they've taken model very similar to ours. Um, and they've looked at some experiments and they've found if the extraction is uniform enough, instead of extracting 22%, they can extract 26% without sacrificing uh, flavors. Uh, so they claim that you can save, you can use less coffee instead of 20 grams, you can use 15. And then if you're saving a quarter of the coffee, you're saving a lot of money. Okay, so this is one of the ideas that uh, if you can optimize these systems, you can, you can actually save some money. Experimental data is, well, we just had the data from Phillips, but there's a lot more data now. Um, possibly you could actually model different chemical compounds or least coffee. And if you can correlate those to flavor, then you've got a much better uh, flavor predictor. Um, we have a few publications uh, if you want to have a look at Dynamic Movement Spotter. Okay, last two slides, um, just some topics which might be similar to stuff that you're working on here, which are of interest. Um, so for coffee extraction, modeling of infiltration is probably the easiest next step. Uh, for this, you need some hydraulic properties of the coffee bed, and then you can add a realistic initial conditions to the model, and uh, that, that's an immediate improvement. Um, grain movement is more complicated, uh, so how do the coffee grains move in the bed? Um, tree phase flow modeling of grains, liquid, and air is quite important. After roasting, coffee beans are loaded with carbon dioxide. When you put in water, the carbon dioxide immediately escapes and that actually mixes the bed a little bit. So that can cause things like flow channeling, uh, fines migration, and all of this leads to a, a less uniform extraction, which, as I said, it isn't so good. And then, well, I'm a mathematician, that my chemistry isn't so good, but there's a lot to be done with chemistry on the micro scale as well. Um, go back briefly to drug release. Well, the problems are all similar, really. Um, so when there is, it's, the effective microstructure isn't very well developed in the literature uh, for modeling drug release, especially systems with evolving microstructure due to dissolution of one or more uh, compounds, uh, the effects of hydrodynamics, uh, determination of effective probabilities in diffusion tensors for specific devices, or now people are actually 3D printing tablets. Okay, so. Uh, this is personalized medicine, so you can 3D print a tablet for a specific, um, I guess it has to be high value patient, um, high value in terms of like a high value drug. Uh, and then the question is, could you tailor the microstructure to achieve a specific release and maybe simulation? Okay, so apologies, I think it went slightly over, but just to finish, uh, thanks to the, the Royal Irish Academy for funding my visit and to Cyprian and everyone here for, for hosting. Any questions?